This is VLX number 104, Take Up His Cross. VLX stands for Video Lexio Divina. This is the online patristic Bible study and free guide to Ignatian mental prayer. God give you his peace. and Amen. God, O oh Lord, we ask the grace that all of our intentions, actions, and operations be directed purely to the service and praise of your divine majesty. Amen. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. So if you remember for the second section of Matthew 16, there are three parts of Christian discipleship and suffering. In the first part, we talked about how Peter was on top of the world for recognizing Christ as the Son of God. And then in the second part, which was last time, we talked about Peter going from being on top of the world to then, then being called Satan for opposing the cross. And then in today's section, the last section of Matthew 16, the last of the three sections on Christian discipleship and suffering, we hear that it's not just Peter, but every apostle, every disciple who must take up his own specific cross and follow Christ. We're going to talk about what that means, the specific cross of each person. Now, last time, I did forget to mention that word scandalon in Greek. That was in verse 23 of Matthew 16. Scandalon is defined as trap, temptation, that which offends, and stumbling block. Now, obviously, nobody can make Jesus dot, 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 sin. I don't even like to say it in the same sentence. Uh, So the translation must mean the last two. That is, that which offends or stumbling block. Christ is against Peter putting up a stumbling block, stumbling block to him walking the way of Calvary, uh, or that which is offensive to God. Divine Intimacy, that book that I'm using, and I think some of you other people are also using that for um, your meditation for Lent and hopefully the whole year. It says, Our model is Jesus, who although exempt from the incitements of concupiscence, willed to be tempted by the devil for us in order to have compassion on our infirmities. Quoting Hebrews 4.15. So notice right there in Divine Intimacy that even Jesus in the desert facing Satan, um, even right there, he was exempt from the incitements of concupiscence his whole life because he's the second person of the Trinity. Jesus and Mary were exempt from the incitements of concupiscence, but still Christ willed to be tempted by the devil in the desert. That's important for us this Lent if we're trying to be with Jesus in the desert. And why does he do that? Um, Again, Hebrews 4.15, to have compassion on our infirmities. I don't know about you, but I always notice that in Lent, there is more temptations, but also more grace. Okay, so if, let's look at this word scandal on. If Satan couldn't incite any concupiscence in Christ in the desert, well, certainly then Peter, as we heard in the last VLX, Peter couldn't divert Christ from from the cross by just hoping his friend doesn't die and by verbalizing that. But this is why we learned last time that St. Thomas Aquinas said of Peter that Christ accepted Peter's affection, but he reproved Peter's ignorance. He accepted the affection, but reproved the ignorance. One of the other things I forgot to mention last time is that Protestants like Calvin say that Christ, calling that name to Peter, they say that proves Peter didn't establish the church. Well, St. Jerome actually already answered that. Peter was called a Satan, that is, an adversary, only for the present time when he withstood Christ, but he was appointed a rock not for the time then present, but for the future, namely that after Christ's death and resurrection, he should become the rock and head of the church. So right there, it's pretty interesting that Calvin uh, could have said such an ignorant thing about St. Peter as late as the 16th century, when if he just looked back in one of the books of the church fathers, he would have seen St. Jerome in the 4th century again said that Peter was called a Satan, only for the present time when he withstood Christ, but that he was appointed a rock, not for the time then present, but for the future. That is, as the first pope of the church. 
Okay, and then the first line for today, again, we are in Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, there's an important verb in Greek there in this sentence. It's aparnisastho, aparnisastho, rather. Aparnisastho, that is defined as to deny or to reject. What are you supposed to aparnisastho? You're supposed to deny or reject yourself. Obviously, that doesn't sound like the, um, the I'm okay, you're okay gospel, does it? If each one of us is called to deny ourselves and reject ourselves, well, another word that doesn't seem important in there is autu, which is his. It's one of those words we pass by all the time. Let him deny himself and take up his cross. Okay, why is that word his so important? It seems like a very unimportant word in a gospel we've all heard many times. Well, because that word autu in Greek or his in English refers to you, to the suffering in your life, not Christ's crucifixion. Look, we've all read this a thousand times, but I think we pass over that simple word, his. What this means is that you have a specific cross to carry in your life. Uh, in some sense, it's even tailored to how Christ is going to get you to heaven. The point is to enter into, the point of suffering is to get to heaven, not because suffering in and of itself is good. St. Bernard, or rather St. Bernadette said, why must we suffer? Because here below, pure love cannot exist without suffering. I think we hear that from St. Bernadette and we think, oh, that's just a sweet phrase from a little French saint. But I believe at the heart of that quote is really asserting that it, this planet is just saturated in original sin and actual sin. Think about it. What, is, what does love in heaven look like? Well, just pure glory. There's no suffering. But what does love look like when it clashes with sin and Satan on earth? It looks like a crucifixion. Again, St. Bernadette, why must we suffer? Because here below... Pure love cannot exist without suffering. That means that this earth is, well, really nasty, and that when love clashes with this nasty earth, what, you, what do you see? You see a crucifixion, which is why Christ says, let him take up his cross. That is your specific cross on this, I mean, it's a beautiful earth, but it's a very nasty earth. And that doesn't mean we're sinless and we're just clashing with a world of sin like Christ who is sinless who clashed with it. But as we start to follow Christ more, we're going to feel that clash even more. And that's the only way to follow Christ through this valley of tears is by carrying your specific cross. Now, that doesn't mean that we reject the, the personality God has given us, but we do deny our passions of concupiscence and we should expect to suffer for Christ. Again, why must we, why must we suffer? Because here below, pure love cannot exist without suffering. Now, if God had left us to our own devices, we all would have gone to hell. God was not obliged to come to earth to become incarnate and to die on the cross. That is pure mercy. Our whole human family rejected God in the garden. And so it would not be unjust for every person in history after Adam and Eve to go to hell. But Christ came to earth and he died for us. And what's so amazing is when he says, take up your cross, he, the sinless one, is not asking us to do something he hasn't done. Isn't that amazing? And uh, Father Lapide has some amazing things to say about that. He says, it says, If Christ were saying, You will not be the first on the cross in death and martyrdom. I, your captain, will go before you. Therefore, just follow me, because I will precede you, not only by my example, but by my help. And I will make you certain of victory in the crown, if only you will follow me and earnestly cooperate with my grace. Then he points to something, I think, in pagan or Roman history. He says, Thus Cato... Before his soldiers going through the sands of Libya used to say, Test your dangers ahead of time by mine, for I will command nothing but what I first do myself. I will give no order unless I myself shall be your leader and guide in carrying it out. Isn't that awesome that a general in war shouldn't be sitting in the back and just watching everybody go and die? The greatest generals in war, they go first. They take the initial hits. And this is what Father Lapide is saying Christ did as our captain. He took the original hits. We're just to follow him. How many leaders in world countries now want all these people to go die for their pet projects? They are not willing to die. Christ, our captain, went and did that. There's some great quotes from Father Lapide. It's a little bit long, but I'd encourage you to stick with me because this is really great stuff today on verse 24. Um, he also says, it's as if Christ were saying, If you will come after me and follow me, O Peter, deny and renounce this judgment of thine about me, and your too human affection, 
so that you may follow and embrace the decree and the will of God who wills that I suffer and die. Be willing to act in all of your judgments, desires, affections, and notably in the death of the cross as God has appointed for you that you may embrace that will, although nature and natural affection would dread it. Then Father Lapide, a little bit later, quotes Pope St. Gregory the Great, that great pope about 1,500 years ago. And, you know, this really answers this question. You know, I think a lot of people today, everyone's so obsessed with what's human. Everyone says, well, it wouldn't be human to do that. Well, what's, what about what's divine? Of course, Christ is 100% human, but what's really missing in the spirituality of most Catholics today? That which is human or that which is divine? We are, we are called to be divinized in Christ. Notice that what we think is so great about ourselves, what is so human about ourselves, isn't what we're supposed to be in life. We're supposed to be closer to what Adam and Eve were before the fall, and we kind of have no idea what that is. This is why we have to take up our cross. Pope St. Gregory the Great says, Christ does not say, let him deny his riches, but let him deny himself, so that a man should go away from himself and become a stranger to himself. Yes, that he should leave off to be what he was, and begin to be what he was not, and become, as it were, a new and another man. Pope St. Gregory the Great continues, We have become something different through our fall into sin from that which we were framed to be by nature. What we have done is not in keeping with what we were made to be. Let us leave there for ourselves as we have made ourselves by sinning, and let us remain ourselves such as we have been made by grace. Behold, he who is proud, if he has been converted to Christ, has been made humble. He has left himself. If a lustful man has changed his life and become continent, he likewise has denied what he was. And Father Lapide adds this. He says, For as in baptism we renounce Satan, and as it were, abjure him, so ought we fully to deny, as it were, abjure ourselves, that is, our lusts. For these are more inimical to us and our salvation than the devils themselves, For we dread the devil himself, but our lusts deceive us by their flattery and profess to be our friends. Can you imagine if modern Catholics feared Sixth sixth Commandment sins as much as they did diabolical possession? But this is what Father Lapide is talking about right here. This renunciation must extend to life itself and death, even the most ignominious death on a cross, says St. John Chrysostom, so that we would rather undergo it than turn away from God's will, even in a single point. St. Basil says, Self-denial is nothing else than the utter forgetfulness of all things from one's former life spent in vice and the relinquishing of one's own will. Herein lies perfect self-denial. If someone has reached the point where he is not concerned in the least about his life, no matter how much talk there may be about his death. Then we have this amazing, almost poem from St. Egidius. This This was a friend of... St. Francis of Assisi. He says, If you want to see clearly, pluck out your eyes and become blind. If you want to hear well, be deaf. If you want to speak well, become dumb. If you want to walk well, cut off your feet. If you want to work well, cut off your hands. If you want to live well, if you want to love well, hate yourself. If you want to live well, mortify yourself. If you want to gain, learn to lose. If you want to be rich, become poor. If you want to live in pleasure, afflict yourself. If you want to be secure, always be in fear. If you want to be exalted, humble yourself. If you want to be honored, despise yourself and honor those who despise you. If you want to have what is good, bear evil. If you want to be at rest, work. If you want to be blessed, desire to be slandered. It's pretty extraordinary words. I realize that that might be very challenging to some of you, but you have to remember the point of all this isn't suffering for the sake of suffering. It's to bring us back to the state we were supposed to be and even higher. It's to bring us back to the state of original justice that Adam and and Eve were at, but then bring us even higher. And this is where the crosses of our lives are surgeries to bring us to the fullness of divinization that God wants us at. Father Lapide says, There are three things which ought more especially to cleave to thy mind. The first is to bear willingly every tribulation that arises. The second, to be more and more humble on account of everything which you do or receive. The third, faithfully, to love those goods which cannot be seen with bodily eyes. Okay, now I want to talk again about that word his. It's so interesting that we have that word his cross. And Father Lapide has quite a bit to say on that too, that you have to, cro- you have to carry your cross specifically, or as Christ says, his cross, because he's speaking of us third person. He says, The Christian cross-bearer may courageously, willingly, and constantly follow me, 
even to death on the cross, and hence to the glory of paradise. So remember, as I said before, the point is to suffer into paradise, not because suffering is in good, in a, good in and of itself. Um, some trouble will occur to everyone which should be borne bravely and patiently. His cross, that is first his own cross, his cross, that is commensurate with your strength and your desires, rather commensurate with his strength and his desires, for God will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you are able. His cross, that is decreed by God from eternity for his good. His cross, that is the one which someone has within himself by suffering or imposes upon himself by self-denial or makes his own by compassion. Then St. John Chrysostom says, Malefactors often suffer such grievous things, lest you suppose, therefore, that simply to suffer evil is enough. He adds the reason for suffering. And what is it? So that by doing or suffering all those things mentioned, you might follow him, so that you might bear them all for his sake, that you might have the fullness of virtue. So what St. John Chrysostom is saying there is suffering is not enough. The point of the suffering is to follow Christ. You know, people who are in solitary confinement waiting for death row, they live horrible lives. I've seen it. But that doesn't mean they're following Christ. Maybe some of them are. Some of them had great conversions. I'm not saying they're not. But great suffering isn't enough. The whole point of any suffering in your life is to make you more fit to follow Christ himself. On the other hand, if following Jesus doesn't cause you to suffer in some way, well, then you're probably not following Jesus. Okay, let's look at the next verse. Verse 25 for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's look at a couple interesting words in Greek here. The word psuchin, psuchin means both life and soul. And we lose both if we exchange these beastly pleasures of this life for an eternity with the angels. Now, there's many priests and even a famous bishop who says, we may reasonably hope that all people will be saved. We may reasonably hope that all people will be saved. These people probably hear traditionalists attack them. They probably think that we traditionalists want people in hell. Nothing could be farther from the truth. But here's my problem with the people who say that we can reasonably hope that all men be saved. If you say, bottom line, we may reasonably hope that all people will be saved, then the practical outcome is that you obtain Jesus, people obtain Jesus in heaven, whether you carry your cross or not, which is the exact opposite of the gospel today. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Do you see how dangerous it is to reject the magisterium's interpretation of the Bible for your own new interpretations? It literally leads others to hell. It literally leads people to think you can have Jesus without the cross. The fact is this, from today's gospel, you cannot follow Jesus without carrying your cross. And if you refuse your cross, there are eternal consequences. But if there's no eternal consequences, then today's gospel is false. And if today's gospel is false, then the whole thing is false. Which is why I'm going to say to you, anytime someone says to you, we may reasonably hope that all people will be saved, turn off such material heresy and run the other way. You know, let's talk about the difference between material heresy and formal heresy. Material heresy is when you speak error against divine revelation. Formal heresy is after you have been caught doing that via a canonical trial. But we don't really have canonical trials anymore, so we can't really say someone's a formal heretic, but we can say, hey, the thing that you're saying is material heresy. To say we don't know if anyone is in hell, is that actually material heresy? Yes, it is. Because the Council of Trent, chapter 3, session 6, says, But though Christ died for all, yet all do not receive the benefit of his death, but those only to whom the merit of his passion is communicated. Because as truly as men would not be born unjust if they were not born through propagation of the seed of Adam, since by that propagation they contract through him when they are conceived in justice as their own, so if they were not born again in Christ, they would never be justified since in that new birth there is bestowed upon them, through the merit of his passion, the grace by which they are made just. So if you don't believe the Bible that not everybody goes to heaven, well, here again is the Council of Trent infallibly saying that there are people, human beings, in hell. But though Christ died for all, yet all do not receive the benefit of his death, 
but those only to whom the merit of his passion is communicated. Not all receive the benefit of his death. That's infallible church teaching right there. And if you deny that, well, I can't call you a formal heretic since you haven't had a canonical trial, but you are espousing material heresy if you even say we don't know if anyone is in hell because, again, the Council of Trent right there infallibly says that there are some people in hell. And I will debate anyone, any place, any time, any forum, including my own podcast, including bishops, who say it's not material heresy to espouse even the notion we don't know if there are people in hell. Yes, we do. It's in the Bible. It's in Trent. It's in all the saints. This is part of the magisterium. Okay, now let's get back to the text, but we are still on this topic of heaven and hell. Father Lapide says, it's as if Christ were telling us today, quote, He who in this life, fleeing from the cross and self-denial, wishes to preserve his soul, that is, his life, and therefore denies me in my faith and persecution, or wishes to save his soul, that is, the desires of his soul or life, wishing to satisfy his lusts, he shall lose his soul in the life to come in hell, end quote. Okay, do you see that today's section on Matthew 16, this isn't just a devotion on suffering. Christ is telling you, if you don't carry your cross, you're going to hell. Today is entirely about heaven and hell, not mainly a devotional outlook on the difficult parts of our life. It is that. It's a, it is a devotional outlook on the part, difficult parts of our life. But it's mainly saying, if you don't carry your cross, you're going to hell. These aren't my words. This is Christ's. Okay, one more Greek word to look at there in verse 25. Um, the word is heurise. Heurise is the verb, and in the perfect conjugation of it, it's heurika, which, maybe you can hear it, this is the exact same word as our English eureka. That's the line from the Gold Rush guys in California about 150 years ago. And when they found gold, as you know, they would yell eureka. Well, it's actually Greek. And it actually works perfectly today in our meditation um, because when you think about that, whoever loses his life for my sake will eureka it, find it. Just imagine the excitement of finding gold after searching for years in California, maybe 150 years ago. That's a fraction of the excitement we should have to take up our cross and follow Christ. Why? Because suffering is good? No, because we carry the cross to paradise. That's, that's the key to paradise. That's the key to heaven. That's the key to being with Jesus is a little bit of suffering for 100 years to be trillions and trillions and trillions of years with Christ in the beatific vision. It's actually very, very small. Okay, verse 26. For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Imagine someone who owns islands and yachts and numerous mansions around the globe. And then, maybe on one of his yachts, one little vessel bursts in his brain and he begins an eternity in hell. Or maybe heaven via purgatory if by some miracle he accepted a gift of perfect contrition at the end. But by the way, that takes tremendous humility and love. You have to lead up to that. But let's say he goes to hell, God forbid. But if he goes to hell, how many times in, in his eternity of burning and being tortured by demons will he wish that just Maybe one of those servants on his islands or someone driving his yacht had whispered in his ear, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? You see, you only have one soul. What can you pay for it? The word in Greek there is antalagma. Antalagma means compensation, trade, price, ransom, something given in exchange. As you know, Jesus already paid that on the cross for you. Only Jesus can purchase your soul. And he has already carried your sins and most of your suffering. You're only called to carry a small amount of your suffering. And even then, you have Christ's strength to do it. And this is carrying yourself away from sin. How hard is that? Nothing compared to hell. This is why our Lord again says today, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's specific to your life. It's enduring the pains of life, the things that have come your way by natural reasons, and the things that have come your way by suffering for Christ. Doesn't mean we have to like them, but we just have to carry it across through life. Father Lapide says, Here indeed the soul is able to redeem her falls by repentance, by tears, and by good works. But in the day of judgment, there will be no more opportunity for repentance and redemption. Behold, therefore, the deceit of Satan and the folly of man. Satan buys the soul of a sinner from him at the cheapest rate for the brief pleasure of gluttony, of luxury, and so on. 
St. Bernard, Bernard says he offers an apple and deprives him of paradise. Very striking words there from Father Lapide. Behold the deceit of Satan and the folly of man. Think of what Satan's tempting us with. The minimum amount of pleasure that he gives a soul he's trying to bring to hell for what that person would trade an eternity of heaven for, it's just insane. But that's why he says the folly of man. That is insanity. It's as if Christ were to say, O apostles, and you who believe in me, deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow me. Because for these difficult and heroic deeds of yours, I shall praise you on judgment day before the whole world and will share with you my happiness and glory in the kingdom of heaven. But those who have fled to self-denial, the cross and the imitation of me, and have followed their pleasures and desires, I shall rebuke and condemn them to hell, and that for all eternity. You must choose one of these two fates. One or the other awaits you infallibly. You see how the, the saints all put the emphasis on heaven and hell on carrying the cross? Again, this isn't devotional. This is the most important decision you can make of your life if you're going to follow, if you're going to take up your cross and follow Jesus or not. This is going to affect you for trillions and trillions of years. It's not just a devotional decision for how good of feelings you have in listening to a VLX section. This is, this is the trajectory of eternity for your life. St. Jerome asks us, Does the infinite vastness of the desert frighten you? But do you walk with paradise in mind? You are delicate, brother, if you will rejoice here with the world and reign after with Christ. That day will come, it will surely come, in which this corruptible and this mortal shall put on incorruption and immortality. Blessed is the servant whom the Lord shall find watching. Then, when the earth with its inhabitants shall tremble at the sound of the trumpet, you will rejoice. When the Lord shall come to judge, the world shall groan mournfully. All classes of people shall then strike their breasts. Then shall the most mighty kings tremble in their nakedness. Verse 27, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Okay, you know, I have a lot of good non-Catholics listening to this series, so I don't like to go too deep into Catholic Protestant apologetics. But I have to say right here, the notion of faith alone to be saved is totally, totally disproved in this sentence here. Matthew 16, verse 27. Because the word in Greek there is proxim, same word as proxis. Proxis is same word as Acts of the Apostles, as in the book of the Bible. So what do we have here in verse 27? It says, Christ is going to repay everyone according, according to what? According to their emotions, according to their thoughts, according to their feelings, according to the, maybe if they just gave their life to Jesus once at an altar call when they were 15. No, at the end of time, Christ himself here says he is going to repay each person according to his praxin, that is his deeds, his acts, his actions. When? At the end of the world, when the Son of Man comes with his angels in the glory of his Father. And by the way, if you're doing the imaginative way of prayer, I think this might be a really good thing to meditate on. I mean, imagine Christ returns before you die. Yeah, we don't know which generation of Christians that will happen to, that Christ returns before they die, but it will happen to one generation of men and women. So imagine Christ returns before you die, as lightning goes from east to west, as he says elsewhere in the Bible. Well, do you ever think that your deeds, did you ever think your deeds would matter at that moment? Or just Christ's glory? Well, both. First Christ's glory, but all of your deeds are going to be seen in light of that. So picture that. All your deeds being exposed. The Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Now, that's, this has been a pretty scary VLX, but don't just picture your bad deeds, but thank God for the good proxies, the good acts, the good deeds that you've done, because you only did, you only did those by his grace anyway. Uh, so see Christ not just coming in glory, but specifically with all of the angels in the glory of his own Father, that is God the Father. Might be a great meditation if you're doing the imaginative way of prayer. Okay, the last verse. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, you know, a lot of modern biblical scholars, they blasphemously say that this was a mistake of Jesus, or rather the Bible writers, since... Well, they say, well, look, Jesus didn't come in glory before the death of the first generation of Christians. Jesus didn't come in glory before the death of the apostles. Uh, therefore, this must be a false line of the Bible. God forgive me for even saying such blasphemy. 
But Father Lapide says Christ's words here, these are a reference to the transfiguration already, which, by the way, is Matthew 17's first section. So that'll be the next VLX we do is the transfiguration. Okay, but wait a minute. What are we talking about here? Modern biblical scholars, again, they say, they look at this line and they say, this line, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming, as if Jesus meant the apostles would see the second coming of Christ before they died. And then these modern biblical scholars blasphemously say, oh, see, whoever put those words in Jesus' mouth thought Jesus would return in the first century. Ah, but this is proof that the Bible writers were wrong. Again, God forgive me for saying that. Well, first of all, we know these were Jesus' words, not just the Bible writers' words. But secondly, Father Lapide asserts that they did see Christ's glory before their death. Where? In the transfiguration. They actually did see the glory of Christ before they died in the transfiguration. For in his transfiguration, Christ gave to his apostles a specimen of the glory, the brilliance, the magnificence, the joy and the happiness which the saints shall obtain in the heavenly kingdom, that he might thereby inspire them to evangelical labors and sorrows, and that they might encourage others to do the same. Okay, and let's just finish with St. Jerome here. This is another great thing to meditate on in the imaginative way, or even if you're not doing the imaginative way. I want to give you the words of St. Jerome, because after we talked about hell so much, let's look at heaven. St. Jerome really places all of today's scary words in the glory of heaven. So we're going to close with this great quote from him. St. Jerome encourages Eustochium, Go forth, he says, for a little space from thy prison, and picture to your eyes the reward of your present labors, which eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. What sort of day will it be when Mary, the mother of the Lord, will meet you with choirs of virgins? When after Pharaoh with his host has been drowned in the Red Sea, she will sing the antiphon to the responsive choirs as she bears the timbrel. Let us sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider cast, cast into the sea. Then will Tekla joyfully fly to embrace you. Then too, the spouse himself, he will meet you and will say, Arise and come, my kinswoman and my fair one. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over. Then the angels shall wonder and say, Who is this that comes forth as the morning, beautiful as the moon, chosen as the sun? Then the little ones, lifting up the palms of victory, shall sing with the concordant voice, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Then the 144,000 before the throne and before the elders shall hold their harps and shall chant the new song. Please say, An Our Father for me, and Benedictio Deum Nipotentis. Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti descendit super vos et maniat semper. Amen.